now that we understand the difference in all angles and how to create different um, angular chromatic perspectives, let's connect those to how we transfer angular motion into the linear component of that motion. And where this is important, you're going to take this into importance uh, when we're talking about golfing and the reason why as you move from long distance clubs to shorter distance, more control clubs, you have a smaller shaft as opposed to a, a, a club set that has all the irons the same length. Um, somebody that has uh, a shorter sand wedge would have better control um, in more loft given um, the, the angle of the club head, but also the length of the shaft. And then as we go forward, this also comes into play when we go into the crack, crank length of a um, cycling and the ba baseball or softball length. Each one of these allows for club, club head speed greater at this sweet spot um, and as opposed to a smaller, easier to control, uh, high, lower velocity movement of um, the bat. So what we're going to talk about is when this portion of the bat, the sweet spot, contacts the ball, could we actually say what the velocity and the linear component of that ball coming off? And, and yes, and we're going to talk about that. Or the power that is pushed, the force that is applied right here on the crank length, how does that differ from the power or the force that is being able to produce on a longer crank length? So when we convert the angular to linear, this is what we're talking about. When we look back at the angular movement system, uh, we discuss all points in the objects go through the same angle. So if I'm here um, and I have point one, which is going to be out here, or we'll put it on the arm. So point one versus point two versus point three, they're all going to go through the same angular displacement. So they all have the same delta theta. What's different is in all these instances is the radius at which they are from the axis of rotation. So if here we have the axis of rotation, the radius is how far out along the line each of these points are. So that is going to be the difference between the two, uh, or between the three components of this. And we take the radius and we go forward, and that is going to be um, where we talk about the arc length. So the arc length is the length out here that is the curved path of the motion that the point goes through along the air. Now, if you look at this, this picture here, that you see that it has these um, vectors, that is actually the linear displacement, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, that is gonna happen. But the distance is going to be the arc length or the outside portion of it. And so we're talking about the arc length from uh, the final position to the initial position or initial position to final position. Um, and so the equation is here for you. So the change in theta equals the arc length divided by the radius. So that is how you're going to identify what theta is. Now, if you look at this, I'm dividing a distance by a distance. So those are going to cross out. Um, so this is where, again, now we're going to start seeing that unitless concept come into play. So make sure when we do in this angular um, to linear, you look at it from a uh, radians, a unitless perspective. So if we rearrange this equation, and, and, and this is what the abbreviation for this equation is going to be here. So you have theta on the left-hand side equals arc length, which is S, divided by the radius. Again, units, units become crossed out. Therefore, you have radians on the theta. If we rearrange that, this equation and we multiply each side by the radius, then we know that the arc length, we can determine what the arc length of travel is by identifying the, the change in theta by the radius. So remember, unit lists here. So the radians or the radius is the units of the arc length. So here we have the units, remember, radians. So it's a unitless unit um, that we can used to identify and keep the units correctly. Remember, if we had degrees, then the arc length would be degree meters or degree centimeters or degree, degree inches, and you can't have that. That's not, there's no such thing as that. So it has to be inches. Taking it a step further, we're gonna identify. So if I was a coach and I looked at this um, and I was analyzing this golfer, what I would do is as this club head comes around, I would be able to calculate 
the angular velocity of the club head to the point right when it made contact with the ball. And so what I could calculate at this instant instantaneously is the velocity of that ball at takeoff. Now, it probably wouldn't be that, but it would be that because that's the instantaneous point. And you'll figure out that we call that the tangential velocity here coming forward um, of the linear displacement of the ball, and then it'd be an angle portion of it. So we calculated the club head speed in the angular component and transfer that into the linear velocity. So this is how we would identify what the takeoff velocity of the golf ball is. Um, and then we would identify the angle of trajectory as well. So going forward now um, is we're going to identify a couple components um, that um, are related to the linear component. And these are angular velocity and the velocity, um, angular um, acceleration into linear acceleration at those points. Okay. So the first is going to be tangential velocity. Remember that we're talking about the tangential. And from the instantaneous slopes that we've talked about, you should understand what tangential is. And it means it's touching the line in one point. Um, and you're going to see this abbreviated. With all these equations, you'll see one hand side is non-italicized, okay? And that's the linear component. The other side, which is a side that has the italics, these are gonna be the angular component. So if you look at this, the tangential velocity, which is V sub T equals the radius times omega, which is angular velocity. So if we look at this here, each one of these components you see here we have the axis of rotation okay and each one of these components you'll see a straight line coming out at a 90 degree angle that is at that particular instant here the tangential velocity coming out so whatever the radius is along this line is that first component and then by following the path all the way around and taking instantaneous slopes along this way or calculating the angular velocity we can calculate the tangential velocity, okay? So it's the right angle, the tangential line, so starting at one point, coming out in the direction of motion is the tangential velocity. It is the radius times angular velocity. Okay, so here we have the V is a linear velocity, path, tangent to the angular path. All right, now we have acceleration. And acceleration is going to be one that's a, an interesting component. And what this is going to be is acceleration is going to be two components where velocity and distance or displacement was only one. Okay. So at this point now, we're going to take it up and separate into the two. And you'll see that we have on this graph here, we have AC and AT. And if you guess what this is, you probably got already that's a tangential. Um, and this is centripetal, you also hear it called radial. Um, and that's actually, and you'll see the direction of it going back this way towards the axis of rotation. Um, and the purpose of the uh, acceleration, centripetal acceleration, is it essentially keeps the um, item or whatever it is in the path around the rotation of axis. So it keeps it within that circle or the angular motion. Okay. Um, and again, if you all look at this, if you see the direction of rotation, um, I'm going to ask you right now, do you think that's counterclockwise or clockwise? And with that, is this a positive or a negative motion? So keep that in mind and, and see if you can answer that question. So centripetal is the AC, which keeps it in the path of motion or angular motion. And then the tangential is if we were to let it go, what is the linear component at that given the radius from which it is accelerating around the circle or around the angular path? So let's go ahead and define these a little further, um, take it into the tangential acceleration. Again, you have an A and a T, okay? This looks a little different because, um, again, this is not italicized. It's just a type of, of lettering I have. So it's A sub T. Um, it's direction tangents to the curved path. Again, here you have, so always when we have acceleration, right, it's gonna be per whatever unit of time squared. But again, here we have the radians. There is no other uh, units for this. It has to be the radian squared because radians, remember, the only way we can convert this into the linear component. So here's your equation, okay? So the angular tangential acceleration is 
the radius, here you have the r again, times angular acceleration. See, here's the linear component, here is the angular component. Now, when we get to centripetal acceleration, and again, now if you look over here on the right-hand side of this, I have it AC and AR, okay? So this is centripetal, and some people you hear them call radial. So this is a travels towards the axis of rotation. So it's keeping the object or the, uh, the material in that um, angular motion around the axis of rotation. And again, we have the equation here. So I've put AR in this, but it could simply be AC. Um, and this is the angular component. And here we have the, um, sorry, this is the linear component. And here we have the angular component on the right-hand side. And again, so here we have radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration is radius times angular velocity squared. And so this is the only one that does not have the angular component of what we're talking about in it. And it's the squared of the angular velocity. Okay, so this is going to be one that you're going to have to keep in mind. Now, I won't give you these equations. So make sure you understand what these are. Um, uh, because I'm not going to have you calculate this stuff, so I'm never going to give you the equation on the test. I'm going to have you explain to me um, what these components are, right? So here's what it looks like. Um, and if we go further, um, you're going to have in the center here, this is our axis of rotation. Our path is counterclockwise in the positive, and we have a couple components here um, that we're talking about with relationship. So here is your it's a tangential acceleration. You have your centripetal or radial acceleration, and you can use either one, whichever one allows you to accept it or understand it more, then you're gonna get it. Um, and then we have a thing called the resultant vector. And the resultant vector is the total um, acceleration due to the components. You're gonna add the angular, um, sorry, the centripetal and the tangential, and that's gonna give you your radial, okay? So think about where this comes into play. And as somebody is doing uh, the hammer throw or even the shot put or um, anything that causes rotation, <coughs> excuse me, to produce the movement, what's going to happen is we can calculate the ball and the motion created about this axis of rotation. And you can identify what the uh, linear velocity, um, tangential velocity, tangential acceleration, and centripetal is going to mean um, according to our equations here. So by calculating the motion, the angular motion of this ball, we can identify at takeoff where the AT, where the VT, um, you, can even, you can even calculate the AC and understand what the motion of that ball is at that point. So again, remember I just talked to you about the total acceleration and that was the AR in that last photo, uh, but it's the sum of the tangential and radial accelerations. Um, here is the A total. So if we look at this, here you have the centripetal or radial component, and then here you have the tangential component. Okay, and if you add the two together, you are going to get the total acceleration um, into a vector.